I've been telling this joke in my stand-up, which I told on, uh, I don't know how dirty we can get. You can get as dirty as you want. This is The Rubin Report, and I'm still Dave Rubin. Before we do anything else today, we have officially launched the Rubin Report community in the Apple App Store, Google Play, and at rubinreport.com. But more importantly than that, joining me today is comedian, podcaster, and now star of the new documentary, No Safe Spaces, which is in theaters as of today, where we're taping this right now. Adam Carolla, welcome to The Rubin Report. Thank you, Dave. Good to have you here. Yeah, I'm you do. A fan you do of yours. a lot of this. Well, I'm a fan of yours, but you do a lot of this the other way. You interview people all the time. I do, and I enjoy being interviewed. More. Which do you like more? I well, it's like well, what do you like more, pizza or sushi? Well, when you eat a metric ton of pizza <laughs> every month, you're dying for a California roll. Like, yeah. So, so this not, is your California it, roll. Yeah, it's not that one is better than the other. It's like all I do is interview, 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 and I like it when it's swapped. I also had this revelation the other day, which is I used to say to Dr. Drew, what you do is easy when we do these shows, we'd be guests on shows and we do college campuses and we do whatever. And I realized when I had to be funny, it was a calorie burner. And so what happened was my, my comparison or contrast was this, I've done a million, um, a million radio, you know, 25 stations, you're gonna to talk to 25 stations over the next three hours, and it's a press junket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I do one for my book, or a comedy that I'm in, or something of a comedic nature, at the end of the three hours, I'm exhausted, because I'm trying to be funny the whole time, mm -hmm. because it's a comedy book, I'm telling them jokes in the book, I want them to think I'm funny, so the book is funny. You gotta keep yourself entertained, too. Yes, although I, I don't care about myself that much, but yes, I do. But the last one I did was over a documentary, not uh, No Safe Spaces, but uh, my Ford versus Ferrari doc, which mm -hmm. was Shelby American and the 24 hour war. And all I was doing is talking cars the whole time and shop the whole time. And I was fresh as a daisy after the three hours because I realized I was talking about stuff I knew. Whereas Dr. Drew gets to talk about medicine. Mm -hmm. If we just talked about carpentry or cars, I wouldn't be exhausted. If I'm spinning the comedic plates, it gets tiring. What level of energy do you have right now for me to gauge how we should do this interview then? I never want to disappoint you. <laughs> so, or your or your fans or right. your viewers. So I'm I'm putting out. All right. Well, we'll do a little bit on the stuff you know and a little bit on the stuff you pretend to know. How about that? All up to you. But you kind of do do a zillion things because you're you're a com you consider yourself a comic first, right? Yes. So you're a comic, you're a podcaster, documentaries, reality shows. Do, do you sort of enjoy them all the same, or it's just kind of you know whatever whatever, you're doing? whatever I want to do whatever's next. You know, I think I think what makes a bad job for a bad job is monotony, repetition. You know, like if you have a job where you go, I work at a medium-sized technology company, and you go, okay, that, that sounds okay. But if you said to someone, I have a job where I work at a conveyor belt, and I just put the heads on dolls, and they just keep, it sounds horrible, yeah. right? Because it's the monotony. So if you think about it, even hosting a late night show for 30 years is still monotony within a good job, you mm -hmm. know? And so, what most people don't like is when they go, he went to the same postal sorting center in Arlita for 50 years and then he died. Everyone feels, goes, well, what a boring life. Like, what a crappy life. So for me, doing a car doc, doing a free speech doc, doing a podcast, um, writing a book, being in a TV show or whatever it is, it's all just variety, and that's all what I, that's all I want to do. So we're obviously going to talk a lot about no safe spaces, um, but your podcast—you were kind of early in on the podcast game, and your podcast is it basically the biggest sort of talk comedy podcast? Like you're kind of, like you and Rogan. It's hard to tell 
sort of I, who's bigger? Do you know? Are you measuring I, that every I, day? I don't know. Looking I know at the numbers? He's, he's bigger on iTunes, but we don't get so much of our listeners from iTunes, so I don't know. I'll, I'll just say he's bigger. I'll be magnanimous. <laughs> uh, we, we're, we're the New York, uh, New York Times. We're the uh, Guinness Book World Records uh, uh, downloaded, so that much. That much I know. That was some years ago. So, do, do you remember the moment when you kind of wanted to make that pivot to the digital thing? Because I saw a lot of comics get all kinds of crossed up. People that had really promising careers that still wanted to go into TV or traditional radio, and then a lot of other guys were like, "No, no, there's something else brewing here." And then they they really started flourishing online. And I I think I kind of went that route, which is what we're doing here. I w I had a terrestrial radio job for m many years, maybe over almost 15 years of, of terrestrial radio straight through that ended abruptly. Um, I was only interested in keeping a communication line between me and my audience and not all of my audience, just some of my audience. I, I was always a big fan of talk radio. I always appreciated the format. I always liked the connection that I felt like the listeners were having with the host. I always knew it was deeper because there was a sort of sense of loss that transcended your favorite sitcom mm -hmm. going off the air. You know, last episode of Friends, last episode of Seinfeld. People were like, oh, last episode of Breaking Bad. Like, I wish it was still on the air. But when somebody like Howard Stern hangs it up, There's or, or folks of that ilk, mm -hmm. there's gonna be a big sense of loss for people, and not just entertainment loss, like emotional loss. So I had been doing Loveline and doing a morning show with no commercials and a lot of talk, and, and, and I felt like a real, like I had an audience and I had a connection. And when my show aired, my show ceased on a, on a Friday, I just said to whoever's listening, if you want to come with me to the digital world, you may find me. And, and I'm assuming most of you aren't because you're in the car and it's <laughs> right, on the right. dial and you're being passive. And, and so if you're not, you're not, that's fine. Like, but that doesn't mean you need me. It means you don't care that much, yeah. but, but for the few, that do want to keep going down this road, I can be found on the internet come Monday. So we won't even miss, uh, uh, we won't skip a day. I'll stop on a Friday. You'll have me waiting for you on Monday. I'm not sure what form exactly yet, but you will get me. And then we will try to move forward from there. And that was really my only concern. There was no monetization that I was aware of back then. It was just sort of, let's keep the connection because it does feel like a death when, and I know from listening to talk radio as a young person, when somebody finally signs off or goes off the air, I'm like, oh, I like that guy. Like, <laughs> right, right, right. There, and, and in the old days of radio, you were just gone. Right. At that point, right. you, just, you were just would gone. have just been gone. So I, I have not missed a day since that date which was, I think, like the 23rd of February, like 2009 or something. So you really were early on this. And I remember the first time I did your show, when I walked into your studio over there, I was like, holy cow. It was before I had my home studio and everything. And I was like, holy cow, this guy actually has a building and staff and it's professional and there's like an area to hang out and coffee and you know all your posters and everything. And I was like, oh, you can really do this on your own. Which yeah. for, for me, it was like, whoa, all right, great. I, there's, a, there's a path here. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> and uh, we'll clean that up in post. Yeah, yeah. Um, no post here. No, the, see, I'm not as professional. No post. Where's the post no department? Post. All right. So I had this radio sort of mind. I had this thought where you want to do a show. You need a producer if you're doing a show. You need a sound guy. Like, you can't just completely mom and pop this and expect it, expect to get the product that you want, you know, day in and day out. Like you want some production. So my earliest thoughts were, I didn't have like, I'm betting on myself or I know this is gonna be bigger than Uber in five years or I didn't have any of that. I just had, 
I know how radio works. I don't see why this is different than radio. I don't know why we would treat it any different. We should have a staff. We should have a studio. The equipment should be good. Do, don't be scared to spend some money to get money. You're yeah. going to have to spend it to make some, like any business. And and like furthermore, I was kind of like, if clients are coming in or potential um, supporters or potential uh, folks are going to buy ad time or whatever it is, they should walk into a building that looks like their money's going somewhere. You know, mm -hmm. like it's that thing of like, you don't want your contractor, and I know that's a sore subject today, but I mean, <laughs> your, your contract- I'm having a little contracting issue at the moment, it's okay, it's okay. Your contractor pulls up in a total rust bucket beater and then wants to charge you a premium, you're kind of like, well, you look at your truck, you yeah. know what I mean? So my thing is like, get a nice truck, get a nice bed box, get a lumber rack, like tuck your shirt in, look, look like you're a good contractor and then charge then go ahead and gouge the elderly. You're like the Jordan Peterson of contractors, basically. Right. You're telling them to clean their room. You must be very impressed with my lighting grid, though. It is. I mean, come on, that is a professional, expensive lighting grid right there. It really is, it really is nice. You'll yeah. love this, the guy who hung this whole entire grid, which these are huge, you can imagine how heavy all these poles mm -hmm. are and everything. I didn't know who he was, I got uh, referred to him by a friend. A guy shows up by my door, he's about 60 years old, I swear on my life. His arm's in a sling, he's wearing a Tommy Bahama shirt and flip-flops. He goes, I'm Joe, I'm here to hang the grid. And he did this entire thing basically with one arm and flip flops, 15 foot high ceilings with a system of pulleys that he created with one arm. It was wow. on, on a 15 foot ladder with flip flops, 60 year old guy, it was incredible. People don't realize like- So people work hard, you know? I, listen, I, I come from the construction world, so I, I understand working hard. And I also understand like the number one killer of men over 60 are ladders. <laughs> like they, ladders and flip flops. Yeah. Ladders and flip flops. It's uh, not, a good, uh, not a good combination. All right, let's talk about this movie, uh, mm -hmm. No Safe Spaces. Because I felt when I watched it a couple weeks ago, I went to the premiere here in LA and you were there and you, you did this with Dennis Prager and Jordan Peterson was in it and Lindsay Shepard was in it and Brett Weinstein was in it and Heather Hying was in it. Basically, I felt it was like a Rubin Report reunion show. I was very pleased. But there was one guy in it that I thought was really incredible and I want to throw to a clip. There's a reason that every time one of these professors or TAs, whether it's uh, Lindsay Shepard in Canada or Brett Weinstein in Washington, why are they all lefties who then say one thing that upsets the left and then they're purged? It will come for you. I mean, that, that's if, there, if there's someone that's watching this right now that is a hardcore progressive that's going, man, I hate Prager and Rubin and this is all nonsense. Guess what? If you have any spark of individualism in you, if you have any anything about you that's interesting or different, they will come to destroy that too. That guy is incredible. Yeah, he's got it. It. I, it. I, I'm sure they're gonna spin that guy off into his own <laughs> series. There's no way they continue down this path with Prager and Corolla when they got that. Yeah. Why, why'd you do this movie? Where, where'd this all come from? You know, I, uh, contrary to popular anything for me, um, as we're kind of discussing off the air, I like experiences. And the answer is usually yes. Like people say to me, why did you do Dancing with the Stars? I'm like, they asked. And like, yeah, but what made you want to do? And I go, <laughs> they asked. And I just went, I, well, actually with Dancing with the Stars, they asked me if I wanted to do it. And I thought, oh, I'm scared. Like my first impulse was like, um, it's like and Bobby Hinton wants to see you in the alley after the seventh grade and you went like, oh, oh my God, I'm scared. Like I'm scared. And then you realize, oh, I have to fight because yeah. I'm like, I'm scared. Like that's what I felt. And I like Prager. I've had a chance to travel around, play some colleges or do some events with him. Prager's a great guy just to kind of kick around with because he's you know, he has all the wisdom and the knowledge, but in this kind of jovial mm -hmm. sort of Uncle Joe from Petticoat Junction kind of fun way, but also is this fountain of wisdom and knowledge. And there's really no better guy. Like, I mean, I have been lucky in that, you know, hanging out 
with Jimmy Kimmel, hanging out with Dr. Drew, hanging out with Dennis Prager, like just sitting next to him on a long flight or something like there's no better guys to just talk or laugh or exchange ideas with all different, but they're like great. And I love that. Like I love sitting with someone and just hearing their ideas and sharing ideas. So, so when they said we want to do this movie and Dennis Prager's doing it, I was just kind of like, oh, good, more time to hang out with Dennis Prager. Uh -huh. I mean, I like the theme, and I, and, I, and I like, you know, if you say to me, we want you to be involved with this product or project, and we're not going to tell you what to say. You, you give your opinions on stuff. I'm usually in. Like, I'm usually in mm -hmm. if you go, say whatever you want. Um, if you say, like, we're doing this project, here's a script, memorize it, regurgitate it, I'm usually like, eh, I'm not that interested in that. But you're going to sit with Prager, we're going to bring up subjects, you guys are going to sort of tag team those subjects, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm in. So the movie mostly is about the college campus sort of upheaval that's going on right now. Do you remember when you first sort of were aware that there was a problem? I was hearing from other comedians that they didn't want to go to college campuses. I was, you know, like anyone seeing in the news when people were going to speak at college campuses and unable to speak. I live in this world where it's like mostly comedy world. So I have this bizarre world where I'm f good friends with Sarah Silverman, but I'm also friends with Ben Shapiro, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would like hear these bits and pieces and like, people saying to me like, I remember like backstage at the comedy store, like Sarah said to me, your joke, that joke, that black joke you have, she's like, so funny, like too bad you can't do it, you mm -hmm. know? And I was like, Wow, that sucks. It's weird that comedians are saying to other comedians, like, hey, that's a great joke, too bad you can't do it. You what, know? Do you, what do you really make of that, though? Because so I'm not a fan of Sarah's. I've invited her on the show many times. To me, she's sort of, you, I don't, I don't want to make this about your friend specifically, so you don't have to answer sure. directly to her, but like, there's a series of comics now that were really politically incorrect back in the day. Like, she's been in blackface, right? Jimmy's been in, Jimmy Kimmel's been in blackface. I don't think either one of them are racist, but by the rules that the left is setting, which they kind of are about those rules, right. now she's saying to you, oh, don't make that black joke anymore. And there's a lot of that happening with comics, and I never would have expected that with comedians. Well, if you think about comedians, she, um, <laughs> the thing about comedians, at their core, they wanna be loved, right? Like they're, you're standing on stage kind of saying like, please, love please love me. You know yeah. what I mean? Like they weren't the most popular kids. They weren't jocks in high school. Like they want, if you think about like, why are comedians like they're very sensitive, which is counterintuitive. You know what I mean? Like Jeff Ross, the roast master, is a super sensitive guy. And mm -hmm. I, I don't mean that like in a weak way, but he's, He's nothing like the Roastmaster. He's a sweet, sensitive guy. Many comedians are sensitive. Many comedians want to be loved. Many actors want to be loved. That's the profession. They're not taking the job of staff sergeant or f foreman. They're, they, they're, they're like doing a job. They have a job that goes like, please accept me. Please love me. So when these matters come down the pike, they're, oh, what would get people to love me and accept me and embrace me and send out positive tweets and vibes and stuff. So they are sort of wrestling with this duality of, I speak my mind, I tell it like it is, I take no prisoners, please love me, uh -huh. please love yeah, me. Yeah, that's a freaking fine line. That's a pretty weird fine line. Yeah. My thing, has always been, I know I'm not an asshole, so I am now free to act like an asshole. Mm -hmm. Like I know, like my whole thing is like, I know I'm not a bad person, so I can say whatever I want. Sort of, uh, if you have, it, it's, it's basically this. 
if you if you have friends who you know they love you and you know you love them, then you let the ball busting begin. If if you have somebody, if you think about it psychologically, like there's that person, there's always that one person at work where there's like five of you want to go to lunch and then there's Andy. And you don't really want Andy to come with you. But if Andy ever catches wind, you you have to like overcompensate. Yeah. Like, oh, Andy, come on, dude. And then he's going, I don't know. I think I'm just going to eat at my desk. And everyone goes, it wouldn't be lunch without you, brother. And it's like <laughs> what they're doing is they all feel weird and bad for not wanting him to be there, that they actually go the other way. Yeah. But if you love Andy and Andy loves you, then you go, we'll get you a burger and bring it back. Maybe I'll take a bite out of it. And then he laughs, and then you laugh, and then he ends up going. Yeah. But I feel that way about making fun of groups or races or individuals or, or anything. If you're, you have some kind of darkness in your heart, like I always say, you know how you know I'm not racist? I make so many racist jokes. <laughs> if I was racist, I'd be like, I don't make any more racist jokes. Like, yeah. They're on to you. Do you think there's some element of it, though, with comics where it's like the ones that have done some of that stuff in the past now, it's like they have to pay penance to make sure that their past doesn't destroy them, where you're saying you're guilt-free because you've done some stuff, right? Like, do you ever worry that, like, they're going to, you know, go back in the man show clips and be, oh, he hates women or any of this kind of stuff. But what they're doing is sort of a more dangerous game because, again, I don't want to make it about those two people specifically, but, like, there's a series of comics now in public people that are calling everyone racists and bigots and all the conservatives are bad guys. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? And it's like, well, you guys used to do that stuff, you know? And it just, it strikes me as just, it's just self-preservation. I get the emotionally damaged part, but it just strikes me as like, it's just business in a way. Well, I mean, look, there, 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 it is a business in that um, it's, a, it's, it's a business where we don't need Matt well, let, let me put it Lauer. this way, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but let, me, but let me put it this way. So yeah. if you showed up, if there was a thing that 20 years ago you showed up in blackface, I don't think you would get the pass that say Kimmel's gotten because Kimmel is a big lefty now. He's a Hollywood lefty, so he gets a pass, right? Where you're, you're more libertarian, conservative, or just sort of out there, so that you, now you're also self-funded, so that helps, right? Like you're your own boss, so that's good, but. Yeah. But you wouldn't get the pass, do you, do you agree with that? Uh, here's what I, th here's my take on it. I think they go where the getting's good. So they're basically feral cats looking for a saucer of milk. And if you don't put it out on the porch, they'll kind of keep going. People don't really bother me, even though I say horrible things. Uh, and, and not horrible things by right, my right. definition, but by their definition. Yeah, yeah. I do have a picture of me in blackface. It's going as Mr. T in, uh, for Halloween in like 1985. I put it out there. I'm like, look, listen, this isn't blackface. This is Mr. T. That's not blackface. Yeah. That's a minstrel show. Yeah. This is me dressing like Mr. T because I'm a fan of Mr. T's. So this is Which a- Which that's the normal, thoughtful way of dealing with this, of course. You weren't doing it to mock the guy, you were doing it out of admiration and love. Right, and you would like to take it and contort it and twist it into blackface, which is sort of general, generic, make fun of black people, vaudeville stuff. This is not that. So first mm -hmm. things first, I'm not signing off on your definition of what I did. Yeah. I dressed up as Mr. T. Mr. T is black. I went with a black face, which is not black face. It's me dressing as Mr. T. And furthermore, I'm not apologizing to anybody yeah. about it. And if you talk to Mr. T, I bet he would be happy that a bunch of kids dressed like him in 1985 and said, I pity the fool yeah. over and over again at a Halloween parties. I used so, to buy Mr. T cereal. That's far worse yes. than doing blackface of Mr. You T. You consumed Mr. T. So yeah. I think with me, they don't really, there's no job to remove me from mm -hmm. per se. And then also, I don't apologize, and I also, the, the, the other thing is, is I don't let 
or I attempt not to let people create this narrative and create this theme, which is, you know, you, there's a picture of you with black, it wasn't paint, I actually took, uh, char I took a, I think I took a toilet paper roll and burnt the end of it <laughs> and then like smeared the soot on my face. But there's a picture of you in blackface. And I go, no, no, there's a picture of me dressed like Mr. T. Mm -hmm. And they go, in blackface. I go, not blackface, mm -hmm. that's a different genre. This is Mr. T. That's from the 40s or the 30s. This is from the 80s. But you still, I go, I'm dressed like Mr. T. It's an homage to the man. And what do you want me to do about it? I'll, I'll put every picture up on the internet. I don't care. Yeah. Are you kind of fascinated how it hits like every comic, no matter how sort of vanilla they are? There's a moment, it's in the movie about Seinfeld telling this story about doing a college gig and he does a joke about a gay, what is it, a gay British king or something? And with, Maybe with French a, or king. a French king with yeah. a loose hand and he's right. and he said he did this joke and the and the kids basically this is like five years ago, the kids basically, you know, groaned. Right. And it's like Seinfeld who I, I love Jerry's stand-up. The show's the greatest sitcom ever. It's like, I don't know any of his political beliefs on anything. Like, he has so guarded what his actual political beliefs are, and he does this silly joke about a French king's hand, and that's even too politically incorrect for these students. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. I've, I've, I've now kind of figured, it's kind of interesting, because I do know a lot of these comedians, and we've, we all know our actors, our Hollywood community. I've now kind of figured it out where you went like, well, I know Sarah Silverman and Mark Ruffalo and Alyssa Milano. Like, I know their politics. And yeah. you go, but I don't know Jerry Seinfeld's politics or I don't know Jay Leno's politics. I go, ah, my new world I... <laughs> order is, is when you don't know, oh. go ahead and check the Republican box because my new theory I started thinking about, and I have some insider trading information here. Mm. I'm like, how come everyone else is out there blasting it out from the highest mountain? I mean, when you're on the left and you're not playing it close to the vest like a Murano, uh, it's a Dennis Prager um, reference, but the, the Jews of Spain who are kind of like, don't let anyone find. Mm -hmm. if, if, you are, if you are back in Bernie or Elizabeth Warren or whatever, and you're in the Hollywood community, you have a bullhorn and yeah. you're on a mountaintop. So if you really just kind of do the reverse math, like, who are the people whose politics you're completely unaware of and you've never heard them speak a word about it? You must go, hmm, how come I've never heard? How come I've never seen them at a rally, right. a women's rally or marching on or sending a tweet out about? And you go, I'm gonna do a reverse math on that. Mm -hmm. So you're saying Seinfeld ain't voting for Bernie? I think. <laughs> The guys who you hear nothing about yeah. have, a, have a leaning that's probably a little less Bernie and probably a little more Trump. Do, do you miss the days when not everything was so political? Because that also is what this movie is about, in that politics has now leaked into every part of society all the time. So it's like you just mentioned Leno, and it's like back in the day, like I never really liked Leno because I didn't know what he thought about anything. And in a weird way, I miss that now. Like, I don't, I don't watch any of those late night shows, but every night when you see clips on Twitter of, I can't even think of who's the host, who's the, who's the? It's Fallon, Fallon, Jimmy, and who's the other one, Kimmel, the NBC uh, one. The other guy, uh, uh, Seth, Seth Meyers. Meyers. It's like, they're just railing on Trump every, like it's the same thing every night over and over where it's so political all the time. And it's made me sort of miss the day that Leno would just go up there and it was just like, he was just doing this thing that was sort of for everybody. Yeah, you know, I think there's an, ele an element of a, a sort of a saturation point. Like you did want Leno back in the day to dig into more substantive issues or sh reveal a little more of himself and, and all that. And Jay, who I know really well, has always realized that this is a marathon 
and it's not a sprint. I, I respect and, that now. I regret, I was hard on him for years when I was doing stand-up, and I regret it, actually. And, and I think he's kind of realized that no good could come from him. I, I also believe, I believe there's some old school comedians who go, you're not supposed to know me. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to know my jokes. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm gonna let my jokes do my talking. I don't want the distraction of you knowing I'm Republican or Democrat or gay or straight or anything. Like, I don't want anything bleeding into this, this joke, these jokes I'm gonna lay over you. But also, when people know, you know, when you take a stand as a, as a Patriots fan, and you let the world know you're the number one Patriots fan, the Patriots are capable of then spending a decade losing. Right. Like, you know, like why declare a major when the next person could get voted in and this thing could swing like the other direction? It seems like you're putting your career needlessly in jeopardy. Yeah, it's kind of crazy for a comic, that truth telling thing and the like thing. They can often just be at odds with each other. Yeah, I, I, I do think that many people, many comedians, as you know, just have a different approach to comedy. And, and also there's an element of, you, you live in Hollywood, you have, you have a job. Um, I've, been, uh, <laughs> I've been telling this joke in my stand-up, which I told on, uh, I don't know how dirty we can get. You can get as dirty as you want. I told this joke when we were doing the... Um, you want to get in blackface for this one? With we the can, roast. We can, we got a guy with some charcoal back here. <laughs> we're doing a roast on Comedy Central for uh, Alec Baldwin. And it's a joke that uh, Larry David was sitting in the front row and, and he literally on a commercial break like came over and went, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. And I was like the greatest moment of my life because I <laughs> love- That's pretty, 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 pretty good. good. Like he literally, then I was like, well, I was like, that joke, I love it. And it's, it's a very Larry David joke, uh -huh. but, uh, and it's also totally politically incorrect, but it, it is here to kind of illustrate that <clears throat> when I was a carpenter or guys who do fabrication work and can shape metal into any shape or a guy in flip-flops with one arm who can hang a lighting grid. It doesn't really matter what his politics are. We can't run him out. Mm -hmm. We can't go, no more lighting grid work for you. Or, hey man, if you're a journeyman carpenter, like, like if you're a good carpenter, you can't be drummed out. Yeah. There's like too many people who need you. If you're an actor, Look, this <laughs> Matt Lauer made $30 million a year. Now Matt Lauer makes nothing. Does anyone miss Matt Lauer? Right. Like, we don't need Matt Lauer. Uh, we didn't need Billy Bush. Like We can just knock you out and go with somebody else. Like We don't need you. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of scary. You live in a town where the journeyman carpenter don't have to, they don't have to worry what they talk about, but an actor, you could get tossed out of this club. And the joke was, I had... Uh, Alec Baldwin sitting over here, and I had Robert De Niro sitting next to him, and I said, two of the finest actors in America, what amazing craft and, and ability, unbelievable ability. Look, look at the, the two of you. I mean, maybe the two greatest ever. I have so much respect for you. But actually hearing, after hearing about the whole Harvey Weinstein situation and hearing a lot of those stories, I don't know if I have such high respect for the craft of acting anymore. I mean, what other job works this way? You want to be a commercial airline pilot? Yeah. yeah blow that fat Jew. <laughs> I'll have you up in the air this afternoon. You want to be a dental hygienist? Yeah. Blow the fat Jew. That's well, like you can start tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, I was making the joke that maybe acting's not as hard. I think that proves your point. <laughs> <laughs> right, so <laughs> actors are in a precarious situation. Now, D Dave Chappelle isn't. Mm -hmm. Dave Chappelle's a journeyman carpenter. Mm -hmm. But Matt Lauer reads a teleprompter. And many actors could be replaced by, whenever they do those things, or you know who was gonna play the original Indiana Jones? 
And you go, oh, that was going to be, you Nick know, Cage? the original 007 was going to be? Yeah. Right, right. You guys, you realize they live in a world where someone else could just take their job the next day. And yeah. we're not really going to miss them. So it's, you got to kind of follow the party line. It's interesting that you bring up Chappelle because you're basically saying a guy like him who has just relentlessly, you know, fought the system sort of, his bravery is what now protects him. Which right. that, that kind of is a theme throughout the movie too, that all of the people that I mentioned earlier from, from Brett and Lindsay and Jordan, who, who else is in there? I mean, just, just oh, er, well, everybody's in there, you guys. There's, um, there's Van Jones, Van Jones yeah. and there's Dershowitz. That, well, that's, so that's interesting, because you guys make a point, and this, this is the part that I'm in, you make a point of saying that there are a couple liberals left. D did you feel like that was like a point you really had to hit, otherwise it would just be seen as you know, a couple of good liberals left, as opposed to just saying, well, then we're just making a conservative movie here or something like well, that. Well, I, I think, you know, I think there's kind of a catch-22 where like someone will say, <clears throat> and, and then there's obviously been this critique, you're only highlighting right-leaning speakers or conservative speakers who are being shouted off the college campuses. You're only highlighting the Ben Shapiro's and the Ann Coulter's. And the answer is, because they don't shout off any, they don't shout out left-leaning ones. So you're, you, this is a weird thing you're asking us to do, like be more even-handed. Well, if Rachel Maddow went to Berkeley, <laughs> there wouldn't be fires in the parking lot, so. Yeah, you mean it wouldn't cost, what was it, was it three or 600,000 to secure that Shapiro event? I think I'm, it was 600,000. I, I think it was six, I think it was no, six. So yeah. this thing of like, we only highlight this. Well, it's like, those are the only people who get protested. So if you're gonna highlight protests, then unfortunately it's only gonna be from that side. We wanted to, I mean, we'd had conversations. We don't want this to come across as some sort of right wing tutorial. Yeah, and it does. I mean, we does wanted not. the Van Joneses and the Cornell West and the Alan Dershowitz eye and many people from all sides and all, everything in between to speak about this this subject, and and that was in, intentional. You uh, you link a lot of this stuff that's happening on colleges in the movie. You link it to sort of how we've raised kids now. So you want to you want to kick the millennials while they're down? I do. I, I do. <laughs> as as I as I travel through this land, I think I think this self esteem movement has really is really the genesis of this. We started because I started thinking like. When I was 19, I, I didn't have any self-esteem. And my thing was like, I'm not gonna tell an adult what to do. Like I would never dream. If I was walking mm -hmm. down the street and I was like 16 and I'd passed a 45 year old guy and he just went, hey, stop. And I went, what? And he'd go, give me 20 push-ups." I would've went like, <laughs> okay, with diamond hands or yeah. kind of do a widespread. Like I would've just done it because he's a dude and he's older than me and he told me to do something. Like yeah. that's how I was wired. So I started thinking like, well, if I were 19 and I was on a college campus and I, I was on a construction site, but if I was on a college campus, and by the way, when I was on a construction site, I had a foreman go, he said, Go to my truck, get my four foot level out of my gun rack. He had like a four foot level hanging on his gun rack. And I said, okay. And I started walking the truck and he goes, hey, run. And I started running because he told me to run because yeah. he's older than I am. And you he also had a gun form. rack, so it was probably a wise move right. by you. Yeah. yeah, where's the gun? <laughs> <laughs> run. It probably wasn't all levels in there. Run you know? serpentine. <laughs> so I started thinking if I was 19 and I was on a, college campus and they announced that some 50 year old with a bunch of degrees was coming to speak, I would never go like, not o over my dead body. I'd just be like, oh, okay, all right. And then someone would go, well, Adam, he's gonna talk about stuff you disagree with. And I'd go, well, he's 50 and has all the degrees. So I guess I'm, I'm probably wrong. And then someone would go, do, does he have the right to speak here? And I go, of right. course, it's not my campus. I'm right. just, I'm, I'm, I'm basically, this is a four year motel I'm living at. I don't own the building. Like, I, who no, it's not for me to. And then if they went, we're gonna go rally and make create a human blockade. I'd be like, 
Why? What? Just don't go to the show. Well, I don't, I don't get it. And I realized. Sort of like a sane functioning person. That's what you're saying. You would have acted like a 19 yeah, year old well, should be. Well, how high does your self esteem have to be to go? Not on my watch. No way is, is David Rubin or Jordan, uh, jo uh, sorry, Jordan Rubin or Dave, uh, Ben Shapiro. Uh, sorry, screw You're combining all like these I people. I combine them into one, one, one big. One horrible one, transformer. One big, yeah, that, that's going yeah. to be that's going to be protested. Why would why why would that be my job? Who am I to do that? So if you think about what that takes, that takes a life of grooming. That takes a life of don't let anyone tell you what to do. You tell them what to do. Like you're special. Your opinion matters. Don't let anybody. You know. How, so the self-esteem movement, I believe, is super dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, how are you going to put World War II, get in a Higgins landing craft and go hit Normandy, 19-year-olds with super high self-esteem? You think they're getting in that thing? You think they're going to rush Probably a German not. pillbox? <laughs> Hell no. No. So this thing that we thought was good, like, hey, what if everyone just felt really good about themselves? Like... That's good if you earn it. If you just rub it on them, that ain't earning it, and that's gonna lead to trouble. So if we go a little meta on that, do you think that's actually by design? Do you think that is just like, it's sort of just kind of like liberals that wanted everybody to feel good and it's just kind of nice, or do you think it was actually by design by some, some bad actors that push this stuff out there to, to weaken all of the things that, you, that the movie's about? I think, it can be traced back to a gentleman who's out of Los Angeles who had an idea, which is like, it was, and I'll paraphrase, but it's like some of these inner city kids and some of these low income kids or single parent kids and stuff, they have low self-esteem. Like they don't, their dad abandoned them. Like they don't feel good about themselves. And if they felt good about themselves, they would start excelling in school and get out of gangs and not be involved with crime. So how do we get them to feel good about themselves? And it's like, well, we can't get their dad back in the house and we can't give them an A in calculus when they're failing calculus. We're just gonna start telling them how good they are and they'll feel good about themselves. And what ended up happening is it turns out like criminals have high <laughs> self-esteem. Like they didn't right. know it's a unintended circumstance. Like I have a good heart. You know, it's, it's basically all that stuff of like, I have a good heart, let's build big housing projects and let people live in free in those and we'll give them food and we'll level, it's like, yeah, you're, you're ruined sounds that. good. It all sounds good. You have a great heart you've now ruined a group of people. That's how you ruin people. You, you tell them, you give them things without earning it. You give them food without earning it, you give them housing without earning it, or you give them self-esteem without earning it. You don't earn it, it doesn't work. It morphs into something bad and then comes back in a weird kind of vitriolic way. So one of the things I kept thinking during the movie is as over, uh, over the last couple of years as I've had all these people on, I mean, so many of the people in, in the movie are, have been in here to discuss the very things they're, they're bringing up in the movie. I've often thought, man, am I overblowing this? Like, am I, am I just exaggerating or am I just finding these random people, Lindsay Shepard, this TA at Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada, which I had never heard of before. Am I overblowing this? And, and then, the answer always turns out to be no, because the next week there's somebody else that it happens to, and the next week there's somebody else and the, and the rest of it. Um, but were you ever worried about that, that as you make this, that it like makes it feel like it's bigger than it is, or do, or do you really believe that it is this big? I think when you, when you endeavor to do any kind of storytelling, there's a balance between making it compelling um, and I know this, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, um, and then I'll circle back. Um, I've made other documentaries about subjects that have nothing to do with this. And I made a documentary about Paul Newman and his racing life, and it's called uh, Winning the Racing Life of Paul Newman, and, and your, your audience would enjoy it. Um, his partner, his teammate, 
and his like best friend and teammate died in a race in Florida. Paul was racing, he was racing. Um, Fitzy was his name, he died in the race. He died, they think, because he had a heart attack when he was driving the car and just never slowed down for like turn three and just plowed in the wall Jeez. and died. And when you're making the film, I'm saying it's more dramatic if he just never hit the brakes on turn three and got in this horrific accident and died. Now the truth is he had a heart attack probably and died and then hit the wall and or died for sure or broke his neck or whatever it is. And as a filmmaker, I'm like, I don't want to lie, but I'd like to make this mm -hmm. dramatic. So I took out the part where he probably was dead from the heart attack and just said, he went down the straightaway, he never break for turn three, he died when he hit the wall, you know? And so there's this kind of thing where it's like, don't lie, but you're also making a film, like mm -hmm. you're trying to entertain. I, I think what's going on on college campuses is bad. I have 13 year old twins. I have reservations about sending them to college and I do hear the stories and I don't like the stories. But on this, by the same token, you're trying to make a film that holds people's interest and the music swells and you, you take a little artistic license and it's a dramatic shot of the smoke burning in slow motion and stuff. And yeah, so of course there's an element of like, we are gonna massage it, you know, like they do in, in you know, in theatrical filmmaking mm -hmm. as well, there's it, it's speaking to the same part of your brain. Like you want people to sit up, pay attention, and and what have you, and it's just a part of filmmaking. Yeah. So the answer is sort of yes and yes. I do think it's bad, but also you take some artistic license and ratchet it up. Right, and you guys actually hit all that because there are moments where you're. It's like my heart was like kind of tight, like oh man, this is horrible. And then a minute later, you're laughing. So right. it like it does kind of feel that when when you see people like I thought uh, there's an extensive portion on what happened to Brett Weinstein uh, and his wife Heather at uh, at Evergreen. And as I was watching it, and I know Brett very well now, and we're good friends, I was kind of thinking like, wow, how did he not see this coming? Like as a lefty professor at a lefty school, did you did you think that at all about how did these guys not see that this thing was just brewing all this time, like until the day before the the kids are showing up with the baseball bats on campus? Well, I think there's a, I think there's a disconnect. I, I've had this thought all the time. Like when I, it's like. Your anti, I, you know, this is a big thing with like Dr. Drew. It's like there's a whole anti smoking coalition out, uh, coalition. So there's an anti smoking coalition. Like we hate smoke, secondhand smoke, thirdhand smoke. There's no place for smoke. And then somebody goes, oh, okay, uh, we now have vaping. It's just v vapor with nicotine, which is sort of inert with vapor. And that's like basically saying caffeine in water. So good, we're happy now, right? And they go, no, no, let's outlaw that. And you go, well, hold on, I thought you didn't like smoke. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, we don't, we don't want. And you start to kind of realize some groups, like PETA's that way, uh, the, the anti-smoking people are that way. There's a right version of that. When I did Love Line, it was like Christian coalition, you know, they're against uh, abortions, oh, okay, good. Now they have the morning after pill. And they go, oh, yeah, we're against that too. And you yeah, go, yeah. wait a minute, that, that's gonna stop abortions. And they go, yeah, we're not, we're not down with that pill. And you're like, wait, you hate abortions, yes. There's a pill you can take that stops the insemination. It's like, yeah, we don't want that. Yeah. Like, okay, okay, so now I'm starting to think you just want control. My favorite one of those is uh, Peter Thiel uh, who's the openly gay billionaire. Out Magazine uh, wrote a piece on him that he's not gay, actually, because he's conservative. Right, And right. That, would, that would trump his gayness. Right, I love intended. it when they do it with gay or black or yeah. anything. Like, I, I can't as Owens, she's not black anymore, not black. because I, I love it. I yeah. love the hypocrisy. And I realize that the group, the sort of progressive movement, 
if you really just take those two words, progress and movement, it's like, this is saying, we don't stop, Bucko. Mm -hmm. Like, we keep rolling. And so I think like uh, Weinstein, guys like that go, they take things at face value. Like, okay, they want a day without black students. Say, okay, I get it. That's a tradition. Like, I see what they want. They want this thing. And it's like, no, they don't want this thing. They want to keep going and they want to keep telling you what to do. And once they get what they want for a while, it's never, they're, they're, no one's ever appeased. Right, we don't, we don't go, okay, we can move on, guys. Time to move on. We're no, good. they go, yeah. who's next? What's next? What can we do? So this day without a black student thing, what the worst thing you can do is just go, okay, good for you. We applaud that. They go, oh, okay. And then they go, Wait a minute, there's nothing to push against. Mm -hmm. The man has basically endorsed this. Right, and and Brett, just for the record, he did endorse it for a decade right. there. He so said, then, if you guys don't want to come on this day to, to, to protest what you view as, as historic discrimination, go right. ahead and do it. But then you get bored with right, that because right. now you're so then not they ramp telling it up. someone what to do, so now you ratchet it up. And then uh, Brett Weinstein is like, he doesn't get it because he's seeing it through the eyes of a sane person. Like, like basically. <laughs> That's all of our fatal flaws in this, huh? Well, the reason the Twin Towers are on the ground is because we did a thing of like, wait a minute, who would fly an airplane into a building if they were in the airplane? Like you would parachute out of the airplane? Like, no, no, I'll be the pilot. I'll be the first to hit the building. And we go, well, no one would do that. Like, I could see him putting a truck bomb and mm -hmm. running, but they're not gonna, gonna fly it in while they're, all of them are in the airplane. Who's gonna see, we don't think that way. Like that doesn't make sense yeah. to us. You have to realize there's a lot of people out there that think in a way that is totally different than the way you think. And by the way, when you think you think it's a universal thing that you, that, that like when you say to me, some people don't like lasagna. I go, get, I get the fuck out of that here. That can't be possible. That's not true. Everyone loves lasagna. They go, some people don't care for it. I go, no way. Yeah. Everyone loves lasagna. I, I, so they don't think like I think and they don't like lasagna and I can't picture that. But you don't fly a uh, plane person. into their home. Well, that's what, that's, that's good, what you're telling me. That's what I'm saying. You don't yeah. fly a commercial airliner into their home. So I'm saying, I think guys like Brett Weinstein is, is saying, well, I think logically and I, I love everyone and I'm open-minded and I'm liberal. So no one could go after me. After all, I teach at this school and people know my reputation and I have a little bit of a Jew fro and I'm soft-spoken <laughs> and I ride my Schwinn in every day. Like, come on, I'm on, this group's not going after me. I'm, I'm them, man. So he's thinking and what he's not realizing is that group can go after anybody because they're never satiated. There's no finish line. They're just going to keep going. Has that sold you on conservatism more so now? Because I see that as, you know, I still describe myself as liberal, but I see this as like the real sort of almost unsolvable problem of liberalism, that liberals always want to be open and decent and understanding and all of that. But then when a movement that is so totalitarian and crazed and, and wants to progress no matter what it's progressing to, liberals don't seem to have a good uh, defense against that where conservatives seem to actually have it better. Well, I feel like I've never felt like, I've never felt it practical to pick a team and then pick all that is yeah. that team. And, and so I'll, I'll answer it in a roundabout way. I, I love cars. I have a bunch of race cars. I drive a bunch of race cars. I have a lot of different cars, like, because I love cars. And, you know, sometimes I'll talk to guys and they'll go, I'll go, oh, they'll go, you're a car guy, I'm a car guy. Like, you love cars, I love cars. And then I go, what kind of cars do you like? And they go, I'm a Mopar guy. Everything I got's a Dodge. Everything's got a Hemi in it. Everything's, and I'm like, 
Well, you're a car guy, but you just have this one uh, car. It's kind of like going, I love the ladies, but only Puerto Rican. It's like, it's like why not get, hop on a blonde and a black chick and a redhead? Like, if you really love women, why, yeah. what's wrong with all of, you know, all, all of them, you know? Like, that's my thing. It's like, if you really love women, go out with a whole bunch of different women. And I feel... Now I finally believe like, that you're not racist. I'm, there you go. You're willing to bang I'm every type of woman. Bang That's every good type man. of woman. Yeah. The, the, and I sort of treat my world politically kind of like I'm just pushing a cart through a Trader Joe's. Like, I'm not really into the Nilla cookies over there, but I do like that jerky, you know? And I, at some point, the cart will start to take shape, I guess, and you'll go, oh, this guy likes his meat, or he likes his protein, or this person likes their carb carbohydrates or whatever. And so for me, it's like conservative. Well, I'm not religious, I'm, I'm basically an atheist. and. I'm not a gun person, but I'm not anti-gun. I'm sort of pragmatic gun. I've sort of realized, like, when you read op-eds in the Los Angeles Times about, sh should we arm the teachers? What difference would it make if one of those teachers at Columbine had a gun? What difference? And then they go, and they go, three kids dead, eight kids dead, 15. What's the difference? I'm like, what's the difference? The difference is three versus 15, yeah. imbecile. Like, I think it'd make a pretty big difference to the fourth kid who would have died if the teacher wasn't armed. So yeah. it's like, I'm not buying into this cockamamie doctrine of what difference would it make. But my thing is like, I, I'm not religious and I, I don't have real strong, like sort of conservative, whatever, upbringing or values. But I do understand that intact families and a focus on education and having a, a patriotic, the, the patriotic part, just sort of loving your country, not to the point where, you know, you, you've covered yourself in the American flag and driving a pickup truck, but I mean like appreciating your country, like going, oh, okay, we've made mistakes, but you know what? Is there anywhere else you'd rather live? You know, like that leads to a sort of happiness. and. Pot, legal, gay marriage, legal, whatever else. Do your own thing. I'm not, I'm very interested in, if I'm not hurting you, I should be able to do what I want to do. And if you're, but, but the problem with the left is the left is saying, let us tell you what to do. And if you say something that we have not vetted or approved, we shall remove you from your job. And that kind of McCarthyism of no one can work because you had a transgression from 11 years ago in a yearbook or whatever it is, I don't like. And the part that I really don't like and the part that's feeling very sort of like communist China to me is like, the forced apologies. Mm -hmm. That's the scary part to me. Like the announcer that is talking about the Baltimore Ravens quarterback, and it's like, well, his skin tone is dark, the ball is dark, the jersey's dark, he has an advantage. And then at some point, he has to go, I regret saying and realize that my hurtful terms, it's like, you don't regret it. These weren't hurtful terms. We want you to analyze football, and you've actually brought up a point I've never thought of, which is it takes a millisecond for the outside linebacker who's coming around the corner, you're trying to get him to bite on yeah. this play fake. You're trying. And just as if I was a if I was an African-American boxer and I had brown gloves and I kept them close to my chest and you had red gloves, I'd have a little mm -hmm. advantage. I could see I could see the red gloves coming a millisecond off of versus the brown gloves off of the brown skin color. And this guy was basically making the point that it, the, the defensive end, and then he went on to say how great the quarterback was. So he's making a point it's an interesting point, and he's right. Mm. The guy can't. The guy does a great job of staying with it. The ball's hard to spot. The outside linebacker bites on it, and he goes he goes around him for a touchdown, and he has to pretend to apologize because he's going to get fired. And when I hear 
to me, the heartbreaking part of the whole thing is the apology. Yeah. The outrage culture and all that, it's the person with the prepared statement begging for you not to relieve them of their job. That's the part that feels like Twilight Zone, wish you out to the cornfield, like, hey, hey, it's a good thing. It's a real good thing, boy. It's a good thing you did. Like, everyone's scared to get wished out into the cornfield, and now they're having to apologize. And there's so many crazy examples of that. Remember when Mark Duplass, who's a Hollywood producer and actor, who's been on my show, he's, he's, we're friendly, and he, said, he sent out that tweet that he basically said Ben Shapiro is not the devil, and then he had to apologize. Like, it's like, he didn't <laughs> endorse the guy, he didn't say he agreed with him. It was in effect like he's not a horrible person. And then, you know, and mob that, comes. And so, it, it's, it's, like Orwellian, but it's also McCarthyism. Yeah. It, it's like, you, look, I, I know the Duplass brothers, they're good guys. Yeah, they want he's to work. totally good guys. They want yeah. to work, they, they live. Now, the only way to stomp this out is for everyone to tell everyone to fuck off and not do it, but Mark Duplass does shows with HBO. They're very woke. This may not hurt him, but are you taking that chance? Mm. I mean, you got a production company, wife and kids, employees, you got a business, you know what I mean? And what he's doing is he's going, me saying Ben Shapiro's a good guy, even if I preface it with, you may not agree yeah, with yeah, politically, there's a whole, yeah. or whatever, and then getting a bunch of blowback, maybe HBO it's does something about that, yeah. maybe they don't. I have 25 employees, do I wanna take that chance? I don't want to take that chance, so I'm just going to issue this cowardly statement, basically distancing myself from a guy who helped me out. I mean, it's, it's completely disingenuous. It's it's cowardly, and but but hey, I got a job. I got to keep my job. Like this is this is what's great. So now you, you and I don't have have that, or maybe it's not helping you or I. I don't know, I don't care. Yeah, but if yeah. you wanna work for HBO, you wanna sell product to HBO, you better be careful what you say, who you associate with, and who, who you do business with, or who you praise. All right, so last thing, so we can wrap up with the movie. Oh uh, yeah. You talked about that Prager guy before. Um, there's a sort of fun moment in the movie where you talk about how different you guys are. Like you, just everything about you, you just said you're, you're basically an atheist, you know, he's a at least somewhat religious Jew, um, your upbrings are completely different, a everything about you guys is completely different, yet you guys came together on this thing, and you were touring in colleges before this, and all that, can you just talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, I, I think we do a thing which is... You see how I brought it around so that you could promote the movie? I do love wasn't that. that. Wasn't that professional? No, That's an safe spaces that was in theater, dot com. Sesame Street, yeah. dot com. Uh, you also go to chassis, C-H-A-S-S-Y dot com and see all these motor racing docs I've made if, if you like that. Um, I don't like this world. I was just talking about this yesterday where it's like we need diversity and people of color and the, and the, and the, and the, and the fire department should represent the community that it, that it serves and it's all that. And it's like, well, so what your skin color is the same color. Like, what, what really is that you're the same? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Dennis and I have common sense. He has buckets of common sense. I'm very rooted in common sense. We have nothing in common, but we do have common sense, hmm. and that trumps everything. And we have somehow constructed a world where you go, your mom's name is Dorothy? My mom's name is Dorothy. <laughs> oh, wow, now we really have a bond. Like, you don't have a bond. Yeah. And you go, you're from Valley Village? I grew up in Valley Village. So what, you don't have a bond? Your skin color, that doesn't give you a bond. Mm -hmm. Your height, your, you love, oh, the Rams are your team? I love the Rams. What the, what the hell kind of bond is that? The real diversity is having different thoughts and different ideas, and the real kinship is sharing common sense and ideas and, and thinking alike. Obviously, nobody could get further away from my background than Dennis Prager. He is, you know, devout Jew, speaks five languages, traveled 
to every continent in the world and most every country uh, is a scholar is is everything i'm from you know four and a half miles that way <laughs> grew, grew up riding bmx bikes and working on construction sites working as a boxing coach as it didn't you know took groundling groundlings classes there's no education no understanding of symphonic scores no anything except for we have a total kinship because we have this sort of common sense clarity i think i would count you in that group as well i don't feel i'm sure you and i are extremely yeah. different in our upbringing and our lifestyle but i feel a, a definite clarity and a kinship with you because of that common sense clarity and i think people make a mistake where they go oh well you're just a republican or you're just a this or you're just a that no to me people think clearly or they don't think clearly it doesn't mean they're right a hundred percent of the time mm -hmm. it's that they want to get to it and you know famously when you were sitting down with larry elder all those years ago uh -oh. and they were talking about race <laughs> here and, we go and he brought up a bunch of stats <clears throat> and facts and stuff and you said you didn't say cut you didn't say i agree to disagree you didn't do that thing where you go like oh yeah i'm gonna pull the real stats and i'll get back to you monday and you'll apologize to me and then never get back to him whatever you stopped and went well, maybe there's something I can learn from this person, and I will be I will be open to it. And I was like, now I respect you, I, I respect you. And and so in this conversation, where Larry Elder is shooting out all these facts and figures, I find myself respecting you. I'm I'm saying because he's open to this, he's he's not going, oh, I was thousand percent wrong. He's going, I will leave myself in this receptive position and if you if i hear things that make sense i'll, I'll give I, i'll think about it i'm not going to ward off of everything because you're on that side and i'm on this side you know it's it, funny i just thought that's what you're supposed to do as a human like it's not rocket science i just thought oh someone's telling me something this stuff sounds pretty good i'll check it out right and that was it i know? always love when um Prager says, I don't need agreement, I just need clarity. Like we just, I need to understand what you're saying and you need to understand what I'm saying. And usually if you're both intelligent people, you'll arrive and if there's not a bunch of underlying issues about you know being in with the school teachers unions or something like that, you'll just all arrive kind of at the same place. But that's, yes, that's how you're supposed to be. That's how you should be. It's called being intellectually honest and I wish more people on the right and the left were that way and it would behoove you to be that way because that's the way you grow and change and evolve. All right, Corolla, I've never done this in the history of the Rubin Report ever, but I'm gonna let you close the show because you're a pro. I want you to look at that camera right there, the mm -hmm. one that's pointed towards you. Tell them about No Safe Spaces, where they can go, it's in theaters now, the whole spiel. I'm, I'm gonna be quiet for the rest, take it away. It's in 200 theaters as we speak. It's nationwide as we speak. It's 99% on Rotten Tomatoes with the people, of course, the <laughs> critics. Yeah. Some haters in yeah. there. That's a mark of a good thing, though. It is. And uh, you can go to nosafespaces.com and find it. And really take your kids. I mean, take the wife, take the husband, take the husband and the wife, but take the 13 and 14 year old sons and daughters and let them know what's going on out there. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about comedy instead of the nonstop yelling you get everywhere else, check out our comedy playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're both right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.